Thank you, Sarah, uh, for that <coughs> kind introduction. Um, I would like to add my own thanks for you coming um, here today. It's a real encouragement for me. It's the first session I've been involved in in TPT as far as uh, uh, one of these resource sessions, so I'm really delighted to see you. Um, you all got busy days, uh, but my prayer is that you leave here with a fresh sense of not being alone as we try and look at this thorny issue of food insecurity and, and tackling some of the issues and problems that you're facing each day in your own communities. But before I start the actual presentation, I think I felt I needed to manage expectations somewhat because this morning we're not going to solve all the problems related to this. We're definitely not going to do that. But I, and we're not going to have a sort of big silver bullet that's just going to make you know, food insecurity disappear overnight. To quote the late Desmond Tutu, there's only one way to eat an elephant, a bite at a time. I'd like to start with some aims for today. I hope you'll find it informative. I hope we'll be able to give you some information that will encourage you. But I've always understood, we've got to go back a bit. I've always understood, certainly in my past business life, that to know where you're going, you need to know where, where you start from. So we'll talk about that in a second. I hope we'll be able to share some ideas between us. And it is very much a sharing thing, it's a two-way thing. I'm not standing here as some expert in all of this and to be able to, to solve all, all of those problems around food insecurity. So I'd like to hear from you and to share some of your experiences, some of your problems, some of the pressures that you face each day when you're trying to serve the communities that you live and work in. I hope we'll be able to give you some ideas of what we are looking towards in terms of equipping you to find some solutions and hopefully some solutions that are sustainable as well. And there'll be more. Um, Kelly will speak on this and we've also got a short video from Rachel Silcock later in the presentation. And lastly, I hope you will feel, as I say, encouraged. From my own experience, just being together and sharing in an issue like this, a common goal, if you like, can of itself be encouraging. And as I said earlier, um, make you feel that you're not in this on your own. So where are we today? These are not my figures. These are from Trussell Trust. And Andy here from Oasis Project is very much part of that organization. I hope my little, yes, do you see the little red light there? So the, what this is telling you is the difference between the parcels distributed by um, Trust the Trust, the food banks, as you know, it's the largest food bank network in the country, <coughs> between these two years. And you can see the growth is just quite stark. Admittedly, this goes back to September last year, but these are the most up-to-date figures I was able to, to get. But the most important thing, and we'll come back to this later, you see this strap line in the bottom here? The Trust of Trust have set out and they've got a strap line that says together we can end the need for food banks. That is quite a thing to aim for. This is a report that um, I read by a think tank called Theos. Anybody heard of it? No? Oh, Tim. Tim is heard of it. Yes, Theos. It is a Christian organisation, a Christian think tank, um, and it's quite a reliable place for people like me to go and get some sort of research statistics. As you see, Gwen Brown and Ron Williams wrote in their preface to the original report, which is about late last year, compassion is not running out, but cash is. This was then updated earlier this year by the author, Hannah Rich, and what she came up with was this. Church and community groups have historically been good at finding sustainable and creative ways to resource their emergency food provision. But even the most resourceful projects have been hit by the wave of shortages. A cost of living crisis is changing not only how many people rely on these projects, but also what they can expect from them. And then she modified that first statement by saying, compassion is not running out, that which is true, but cash is, and so too are the leftovers. And I'm sure you've all experienced that. I know, for example, um, am I right, Maria said uh, that you'd seen donations drop by 80%? Yes, I, I would actually suggest it's even higher than that now. That, that stat was from last year. Yeah. Um, we've particularly seen a, a further decrease in food donations. 
Because the thing is, if you think about it, the cost of living crisis is hitting everybody, pretty much. And if you're in your supermarket, you're about to pay for your trolley's worth of food. Perhaps before you would have been quite happy to take some of that and put it in the donation box. But now, maybe, you're having to think more of your own situation and your own family. And that's had a knock-on effect. To the, to the what we would say, So in essence, what this original report is saying is that churches have historically been that place of sanctuary um, and aid were, 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 um, you know, was available. But churches are struggling, I'm sure I'm, as it were, preaching to the converted here, to cope with the impact of the cost of living crisis. And there is some implication within this report that some churches will have to close because of it, which is very sad. Something needs to change away from what has been referred to as a hand out to a hand up approach. That's not my original phrase, um, but it's been coined quite a lot. In fact, I think the guy who uh, set up Big Issue, that is one of the major strap lines they use, not a hand out, but a hand up. Giving to those who need help means an ac access to affordable food, um, and it is very imperative to their life. This is the Food Foundation, another resource that I use quite a lot. It's a really good uh, resource for information. And look at these figures here. In January 2023, 21.6% of households with children reported they've experienced food insecurity in the past month, affecting an estimated 3.7 million children. This compared to 11.6% in January 2022. <coughs> Cooperative, collaborative. Um, if you recall, one of the main aims of today was to equip you guys um, as best as we can to help facilitate that. And I'm in the moment I'm going to ask Kelly to come up and speak and present around something that I know that uh, a lot of people are asking about and has proven successful in other towns and cities, which is like a cooperative model. But just before she does, um, can I highlight... Just another potential strategy, which sort of links into some of the queries you raise now. I mean, I personally would like to see an awful lot more collaboration, and the very fact that you're here today hopefully will kick that off. Collaboration amongst the churches. Each church could have a particular strength they could bring to pool resources, if you like, uh, in a practical way. And forgive me if you're already doing this, but I sense that across the city it's not being considered enough. And if you recall what I was saying about some churches are potentially having to close their doors, perhaps this is one way of avoiding that, by collaborating. So I'm going to go for the flip chart. And um, I am no artist, so I'll make my apologies now. If you give me an example of what I mean, you might have Church A over here, which has good physical premises. But what they might not have is the people asset. And think of these all as assets that each church might have. They might have a lot of people that go there, but they may not have a means to um, have a physical building that will do the job. Let's go back to that. You might have Church C, who have a very wealthy church, they're, they're very giving church in terms of financial support. But again, they may not have ideal premises and they might not have the people asset. And then finally, which I know Kelly's going to touch on, they might not have access to the food, surplus food, that they need to support all of this. But what if? They could pool that, or some of it. They might avoid closing the door, but more importantly, it might supply the needs to that community by taking the strengths of these respective churches and bringing them together. 
I see my role partly very much as facilitating that. And if you're not already doing this, and if you, you in your local community, I would like to see if I can make that happen by putting you together, by finding out what these little bits of the puzzle are, and then bringing you together to make the jigsaw. Does that make sense? Okay. Personally, don't see a problem in that church using their expertise to run it, as long as they're willing to do it, of course. But as long as they make it a clear, defined, restricted fund. Okay? Thank you, Arthur. I'll pay you later. <laughs> right, I'd like to introduce Kelly, cooperative food organizer. Kelly and I work quite closely together, and I will leave her now to do her presentation. I'll take my stuff away. Yeah, flash through those, looks good. There I am. Okay, so I am Kelly Fritcher. I'm the cooperative food organiser for Plymouth. I'm funded by NHS 7, and I work in partnership with Four Greens Community Trust and Plymouth City Council. My role is to help set up sustainable food crops in Plymouth. That role has changed. When I was taken on in November, it was purely just to do one thing. A food co-op was... 20 people coming together in a community and we would buy our food and share our food and split it between us. But I had some time to do some research and have a look at what are we already doing in Plymouth? What do we need in Plymouth? How would this work in Plymouth? This model was taken from London in Camden where it works really, really well but is very different actually to what we'd be able to do here. So we've changed it and we have some trials that we're going to implement. So I'll put them in just a second. So my first six months were understanding the Corporation Town model. That's the model that came from Camden. That was developed by three women coming together to say, we have no food provision, really, for us, where we live. There is very little that we're able to get hold of to help people in our community. So what can we do differently? How can we work together to make a difference for ourselves? and not rely on other people to be able to do it for us. And they set up Cooperation Town. It's a workers' co-op, and then they developed this cooperative model where they have lots of different groups. They're a hub now in Camden. There are over 30 groups that come into that hub. They all have 20 people each in a group. They come in, they get surplus food, they split it down, and they share it out. There are some differences between the surplus food that's provided in London to what we get in Plymouth. Surplus food in London is actually free. They don't pay anything at all to the Feed It's Project who partner with Fair Share. So it is different. So that's why we had to look at how can we make this work differently here for us. Um, then understanding the current provision. So what we already have in Plymouth, and it was huge and varied to be able to understand all the food provisions that are provided everywhere. Community larders, community fridges, our food banks. I went out and visited lots and lots, and that's where I've seen lots of you. Um, then understanding from feedback, from asking everyone what's working, what's not working, what can we do different, what can we do differently. I'm just going to have to drink water quickly. This doesn't make for a very good recording, does it? Kind of? <laughs> 
Um, and then understanding the circle of life. And that was probably the biggest issue, actually. I think when we took on this project, we thought, this is going to be very easy. We find 20 people, we get them some surplus food, they, they actually pay for the surplus food themselves, they split it, they share it, off they go. What we didn't take into account was, there's very little surplus supply, actually, within Plymouth. Being able to get that surplus food, we put on a big waiting list to be able to get it, and Fair Share, who provide to us here in Plymouth, and have a depot here in Plymouth, provide right the way down to Cornwall. There are lots of groups that they provide to. So these were some of the issues that we looked at. And this is what we came up with. Trialling four sustainable models. So food co-ops, actually 20 people coming together. They need a location, breaking food down, and taking it away and paying for it themselves. Every one of those 20 people is paying in and taking something away. Co-op fruit and veg crops. So this is a trial that will be done at Plymouth University. It's in connection with the student union. Uh, they are already up and running, co-op fruit and veg boxes throughout the country. But we looked at a way that we could actually help provide a resource to people at the university using fair share and what they have in abundance. And what they have in abundance is fruit and veg. Our co-op food clubs looks very, very similar to St Albans. So we're allowed to look at that. So I will cover these all off in more detail. And then a co-op social supermarket. So they are the four trials that we're looking to run throughout the year. Why do we need food co-ops? So John's covered lots of this, but affordable food clubs can offer a sustainable community food provision. They should help ease the pressure on your weekly shopping budget. They are not your full weekly shop. They're not meant to be a full weekly shop. They have been proven actually to ease the pressure on food banks in the areas that these have been trialled because quite a few people will get to the end of the month and that's when they're really struggling and they need some help. And this should help that. It is proven through affordable food clubs that actually people are able to find a way of being more resilient and then actually not needing to go to a food bank because they're able to buy the items that they need at a reduced cost. So food co-ops are run by members. It does ease the pressure on the current volunteer situation because we ask for so much from so many of the places that already provide lots currently. So it's everyone who's in the co-op helps to run the co-op, helps to split the food down. Food co-ops give people choice and dignity by being able to choose and pay for food while saving money on supermarket prices. So it's not saying that we're in a place where actually there aren't people that really can't afford this and they would still need to use the food bank. But it is saying that there does need to be another option for people. And we offer additional services. So pet, citizen's advice, food is fun, and we do food safety training for volunteer members as well. So there are lots of other services that are provided at the food co-ops because we know that food is just one factor why someone's coming to us. What is a co-op? I'm asked this quite a lot. It's, do you work at the co-op? So, so it's just a co-op, a collective of people coming together. So co-ops are open to everybody and anybody can be a member of a food co-op. So we do not means test at all. They are set up in areas currently that are high deprivation areas. So we know we are targeting people that we need to target, but it will be open to anyone. They are run by the members, so food clubs are run by volunteer members, and food co-ops are run by members completely. Working in cooperation with others, so we share everything. Cooperation Town, who run the food co-ops, everything for them is online. You can get access to all the information, you don't pay for anything, you don't join anything. It is open for everyone to be able to use it. Concern for the community. So that's about understanding as a co-op, that's what we do. Each individual co-op will be different because it is what's needed in your community. How can it work? What do you need to do differently? They will all look and feel different. Education and training. So that's why we look at our 
volunteer training pet citizens advice it is about not just looking at one issue looking at everything together uh, member economic participation is we actually contribute so everybody's contributing financially and taking something away they are not for profit all the money goes back into fee autonomy and independence they all look different they are all run different and that's decided by the members who are in them not by anyone else when i set up a food co-op with the group it is just for my experience some of my expertise and then i walk away and it runs because it's the group they own it not me so food co-ops food co-ops are smaller groups a minimum of 10 people a maximum of 20 people the reason is you need at least 10 people to be able to have enough money pulled together to then pay for the surplus food any more than 20 people you're all agreeing on something together that can then start to become difficult when we have lots and lots of voices when you get to 20 people you do get a waiting list if you've got enough people your group splits and you can create two co-ops they are run and owned by the members of the food co-op so those people that make up the group run the group and own the group they are learning transferable skills because each person in the group has a different role so you have treasurers, co-treasurers, you have bargain hunters, you have people that help to slip the food down. And we do advise to swap those roles every so many months, so you're all learning different skills. Members pay weekly, and they contribute an hour a week to help run the food co-op. So that is what's different. We are paying in, we're giving our time as well to help do this. And we are getting something back from that. It's open to everyone. Uh, the only money spent is the money that's invested by the members and then the amount of money that you pay in as individuals will all be the same but that's decided as a group and that's based on what do we want to buy what is it that we want to purchase so you could buy surplus food you could use local suppliers you could buy in bulk and save money on food costs they do have limited overhead as they can be run inside schools community centers churches village halls the groups need two hours, really, for the fair share delivery to come in, for them to split the food down, for them to take it away. So we are doing trials in quarter three, and it will be with Mayflower School and St James the Less working in a collaboration together, and also Mutley Baptist Church. So those are the two places that we are trying in yet. Now with these, what we've looked at is what's the easiest way for these groups to be able to get access to food and to split it down. So Fair Share have lots of access now and they've just got um, a big contract for fruit and veg. So that's what we're going to get delivered as food co-ops. It'll be in big trays, it's like loose apples, loose oranges, loose onions, so that they can split it down together as a group of people and take it away. There are a couple of reasons for fruit and veg. We have access to it, it is plentiful. We also know from research that's been done that fruit and veg is really expensive now and it is one of the items that people will say, look, that's not an essential that I'm buying something like that. An essential is I need to get milk, I need to get bread and that's something that can be missed off. And we also know in areas of high deprivation, those are the things that are missing from people's diets. So that's why we focus on those. That's one of the deliveries from Fair Share for the fruit and veg. Okay, so a food co-op club. A food co-op club is a medium size. It's 30 members per week. There is a reason for 30 members. We've been getting the deliveries in from Fair Share and we know 30 members is sustainable for us with the amount of food that we can currently get in. Members pay a annual fee of £3.50 and they pay a weekly fee of £3.50 for 12 items. So you need 360 items if all 30 members pay. So it's £105 that can be made if all members pay £3.50. The reason I say all members is because not everybody wants 12 members. So we support some single households where actually they'll say, can I do six for half the price? And obviously that's what we do. We are based on a fair share band three, so that's 150 kilograms of stock and a total cost of 60 pounds. That's the model that we use. It's open to everyone. 
Again, there are limited overheads because members use a village hall, a church, a community centre for a few hours once a week, but they do need some storage space. So this is different to a food co-op. That is run by those members. They come in, they break it down, they take it all away. It's gone within two hours. This needs some storage space and also some refrigeration. It is set with food base and fair share provide around 60% of the stock that's needed. So you do need to find another surplus supply of food or funding and that's what helps maintain the model. Fair share alone does not maintain the model, it's not enough. It's run by volunteer members but it is headed up by the overall organisation, not the members. So our trials are currently live. They are in Manningham Sports Hub and Southway Youth and Community Centre. So Southway Youth and Community Centre, they run this. Now they are actually members of the co-op, so they do volunteer their time and they are part of it as well. In Manningham Sports Hub, that's headed up by the Plymouth Argyle team. There is one paid employee that does look after that. The rest are all volunteer members that do that. Yeah. In terms of how much you pay or the banding you're on, or yeah, we just do a, a, month, uh, a yearly uh, subscription to it. We're, we're talking to get sponsored for that, and that helps our organisation. But we don't have to, yeah, and we don't get any control over what we do. So, in our food co op clubs, we don't get control over what comes in. Mm -hmm. It's you just pay for weight, so it's £20 per 50 kilograms. Okay. And you can work it out how much it costs you weekly. You can pay annually if you'd like to. Um, but with what we've asked for, for our uh, co-op, so our groups, our 20 people coming together, we've asked just for fruit and veg, because we know that's much easier to break down. Mm -hmm. If they were sending in boxes of cereal and 20 people were having to share out four boxes of cereal, it gets really complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we looked at that. That's why we, we have some control over what's coming in there. Yeah. So this is the man of the Sports Hub Fair Share Delivery. This is the Southway Food Co-op Club. Co-op social supermarket. So this is our biggest group, over 100 members. It needs a permanent space. It needs to be open more often than just a couple of hours once a week. It's run by volunteer members. Again, it would be open to everyone. It would look and feel more like a normal shopping environment. That's really the biggest difference between this one and the food co-op club. It's a permanent space that's always there. It's open more often and it does feel more like a shopping environment. And annual membership be the same, all items paid for weekly. Now, we've got lots of models that we're looking at, and lots already work on a point system, or it could again be so many items for a certain amount of money. They require fixtures, a smart till, fridges and freezers. They do require some investment, and we're looking at four being, being in the trial there from four to four. What I will say about all of these, is that we've been able to agree all of this with fair share and these being the only trials that we can run up until the end of this year. They are not in a place where they're able to take anybody else on until at least November currently. Obviously lots of things change, lots of groups might decide that they're no longer going to be running, things might become available but there is a wait list to join currently. So what's needed? Space to store food, dedicated time each week in a host organisation, members, volunteers, food supplies, sponsors, donations from businesses, transport to collect food, training, marketing costs, that was leaflets, posters, flyers that we did, costs to set up, fixtures, fridges and freezers, and food safety training and compliance. Now when we looked at this, um, we were setting these up. We didn't think there'd be any issues with anyone coming along and saying, actually,
chilly. These are the things that you need to do, food safety-wise. Are you checking the temperatures of your fridges? Are you? So I have contact with Dave Lee, who does go out and do the visits, and he has visited some of you, to say, look, we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> and we don't know any of this. So could we have some training before you come and visit us and look at us as food gardeners and as so that we know what we should be doing, what we should be checking, what makes us compliant. So he has agreed to run a workshop for us, and that's in July, and everyone is welcome to attend that workshop. It is completely free. You've got some of the information there, haven't you, John? So it's on the 20th of July on a Thursday in the morning, and uh, everyone is invited. You just need to let me know if you can, if you are coming, so that I can let him know rough numbers if you are already running something. And those are our members who are volunteers. This was how we advertise. In Madden, when we set it up, they, they don't have a real sense of community there. It was a sports hub. So there's not a huge amount of people coming in and a feel of community. So it was very difficult to get 60 people signed up actually in Madden. And they have 60 people because they're open two days a week. Whereas our other food co-op, which was based in Southway, in a youth and community centre, got 30 members within the first week that it opened. In Manhattan, when we put it up um, on social media, it sold out within a few days. And then we started a wait list. And they have been able to open that up to more members. Because we have said a maximum of 30 people, but we know if we get 30 members join us, not all 30 people will come every single week, because not everybody needs to use it every single week, but it's by us learning well, how many people are coming regularly, then how many more people can we add from our wait list. Mm -hmm. So that's the way it's working. And this is the food co-op, those 20 people coming together to split and share food. So four very different models that we're looking at four different trials that we're running um, and hopefully working in collaboration to be able to do it. Does anyone have any questions at all for me? Hi. Oh, great. <laughs> So we've looked at, oh yeah, so in terms of mapping and looking at where we are uh, setting up our food co-ops, we looked at where are the gaps, where are there currently no provisions, so that's why Southway and Manadin were picked. We also look at who's willing to work with us. We need host organisations that will work with us. So yeah, what is currently there? Do we have a community builder or someone in place to help build up that area? How high are they on the deprivation list? And have we got someone who's willing to work with us in that area? Um, second one, actually, around the food supply thing. So there's a lack of it. Um, is part of that caused by organisations like Rogers? So three mm -hmm. PL companies are companies that buy food that would otherwise have been given to places like Fair Share. So the surplus supply is being interrupted, yes, and the food is being sold off. But that, that's down to those to the company to make that decision. So I know, for example, the co-op group have made a commitment now as to how many of the product will be sold off and how much of it will be given to charity, and they're going to give a greater portion to charity. give away food beyond itself, but, it, but there is a lot of legal compliance that comes with that. There's a lot of documentation and records you need to keep. A daily will cover it off in the workshop that he's doing. It has to be traced. And if a sell-by date is being extended, which is something that they do do at Fair Share, um, not regularly actually, you don't get a lot that's out of date from Fair Share, there is a lot of compliance around it. There is. 
So it can happen. They are, yes. Look, feel, smell, yes, absolutely. And it will make that part of it easier. We know there is surplus food. And then we know there are lots of places where we are able to get that surplus food from. However, when we buy surplus food from places like His Church and InKind Direct, we're buying in bulk, in pallets. Each group individually is going to struggle to be able to do that, to pay £500 up front and get a pallet of mixed food delivered to them. That's something that we're looking at as part of a different group that we're on, where we're working in collaboration with Plymouth City Council to say, how can we all work together to pay for this food? Where can we store it? What can we do? But that is part of a much bigger thing that we are, are looking to try and achieve for the city. It would make it much easier if we had somewhere where the surplus food was coming in, where everyone could just go to and pay for the food that they need as they need it and be able to take it away. Without that, we struggle really. We do encourage our groups to do that. That's part of the bulk buy model with the cash and carry and being able to visit. But not just there, there are other places obviously, like Booker's, Farm Foods for example. But if we were able to get it straight from us, we'd be getting it cheaper. Anybody else? training and how successful is that training in them being able to be resilient and do it by themselves so yes what we look at for somebody to be a treasurer it sounds really complicated but it's not it's a sheet with who's paid in this week who hasn't paid in what's the total amount of money at the bottom and how much do we have to pay for food that's it that's purely all it is they then go on, absolutely, so I've seen them, I've been to these groups and done lots of different ones of them. And people get nervous when they're first asked, can you take over the treasurer role? Could you be a co-treasurer? We do also ask, what skills do you currently have? So at the one that we're looking to set up at Mayflower, there is somebody that has been through the maths course at the school. And so we know what well, be the ideal person actually to then help broaden that role. So it's those kind of, but none of the roles are complicated or require a huge amount of training. The way it's all set up on the spreadsheets, it's all been done really, really self-explanatory. Everything is there and printed and accessible for everyone to then just come and use and write on them. Even a bargain hunter is someone who, very much like me, goes to a supermarket and looks for a bargain, goes to the best supermarket where that best offer is on. We're just looking at what skills you have in you already that we could use in the co-op. Oh,
yes, that's what they're looking to do. So you'd have this one person, me at the moment, that sets them all up and that you come back to and say, I've got, which my groups already do, that this is something that we need or this is something that we haven't thought of, how do we do this? And last week it was that we've got this amount of members coming to us at Manadam, but we think we can sustain more. Shall we open up the list? And it's just a, yes, absolutely. So we have calls once a month where it's just around what can we do differently? Is there something we need to change? Are there any questions that need to be answered? Um, and there are lots of groups that I can then rely on and go to to answer any questions. safety thing I think you know if you haven't already gone through it <coughs> it's not that onerous um, yes you have to have a food safety certificate but quite honestly you do it online I'd be surprised if anybody fails um, Dave Lee who runs this course I've had a lot of contact with him over the last couple of years he's a really nice guy very approachable guy um, and I'm sure he'd make it you know accessible as far as the training is concerned but just to reiterate 20th of July Four Greens Community Trust but it can be done if you're a PFAN network member, you can join it by Zoom as well. But I think we'll probably inform you a bit more about that. Um, <coughs> oh, sorry, PFAN, Pl Plymouth Food Aid Network. Um, if you're not already a member of it, I'd encourage you to be because it's a real, really good resource for information like this and for training. Thank you, Kelly. That's great. Thank you. Um, right, <coughs> time's going on. Three C's. Talk about cooperative, collaborative, and now citywide. <coughs> All been well, if the tech is going to work, we're going to now hear from Rachel Silcock. Many of you may know her, but just to be, uh, give a, uh, some sort of introduction, Ra Rachel has worked in a variety of roles within the Plymouth City uh, setup, but she's currently the Strategic Cooperative Commissioning Team Lead. Um, and she's been involved in a strategic lead for, in terms of older people, carers, and dementia and a specialist role in stroke services, leading on advice and information services and mental health commissioning. But her main role at the moment is very much around well-being and prevention services. And of course, food is fundamental as a well-being issue. I'm really grateful for her to take her time out to, to do this video for us. She would have loved to be here, but she's on holiday, so I think we can give her that. Everybody, Rachel Silcock from Plymouth City Council, Community Empowerment Lead. I'm sorry I can't be there. I would really like to have been there, but I am on holiday. However, John has asked me to produce this video. Um, and the idea is that I'm going to give you a bit of background into what I think um, the history of food insecurity within, within the city in the last couple of years. And then, and then what the council's view of that is. And then how we're hoping to take that forward and work with you as churches in, in that as well. So... In terms of food insecurity in the city, I guess we recognise that um, during the COVID-19 emergency, um, you know, we needed to provide a response to the emergency and the government were very much funding food um, as one of the, uh, the, the important issues to make sure that everybody had access to food. And so we were providing food really to anybody who felt they needed it. There wasn't really any criteria, um, whether, whether that was through the, the council itself giving out food parcels or through our really great um, Good Neighbours scheme where lots of volunteers came together and helped to give out food. And then we also had um, quite a lot of funding from the government um, in the first, in, in fact, in, in all three years really of the pandemic, starting in 2020, um, we had funding to provide food, particularly to people who, who were shielding, but also um, ongoing from that, we, um, we, it became, as we know now, the Household Support Fund um, was funding for food for people, particularly um, low-income families during the school holidays. So food was uh, funded, we were giving out money, um, you know, we have the holiday programme for low-income families, fit and fed, um, but there was particularly a lot of, uh, you know, food. And it, and then in the in the second year of the pandemic, we obviously had the emergence of Fair Share as um, an organisation that came back into the city and were able to provide um, lots of surplus food. As we know, um, now the surplus food is, is reducing very much. Um, because of all kinds of for all kinds of reasons uh, the cost of food of course as we know is spiraling so the sort of need for food is increasing whereas the actual supply of food is going down this this provides us with a, with a real issue um 
So in terms of that, what we're, what we're doing with a household support fund, uh, as you may, may know if you've applied for funding in the last year, we, we did emphasise the idea that we wanted f- uh, funding to go to organisations that were looking at providing food in a, in a different way, not necessarily for free food, but possibly through the development of, of um, a small charging policy, uh, food clubs and food cooperatives. So the... Um, the long term aim that we have is to create a system where where free food is available but really mainly in emergencies or crises so we you know we we are supporting organiza- organizations like um uh plymouth provide sorry provide provide devon rather sorry um and uh, the food banks but however the focus should really be on a what we, what we call a cash first approach so really helping people to to access uh, financial entitlements and benefits and advice on 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 debts and income maximization in the first instance and then moving towards um, a more a sustainable type of model where food is provided as i said through food larders food clubs and food co-ops um so so for this to this end we have um we have we have funded the uh Post of food food co- food co-op coordinator, which is Kelly Fritcher, who is uh, I think is speaking to you today. So we funded that post to help us set up set up that new model of of food supply, and um, we we are also working on two other on two other initiatives. With uh, one one of them is with Food Plymouth, where we're um, working towards setting up what we're calling the Plymouth Food Alliance. This will. Um, be a more structured approach to providing food aid where we're expecting it's based on the Torbay model and we're expecting to have a portal where people will apply for food aid and we they'll be able to get it almost immediately but we will know who's getting it we'll be able to direct people and at the same time as them getting the food aid they will get um, advice from um, from an advice service as well so that's kind of fit the food alliance portal offer which we will hope to, to develop by the end of this year uh, and um, that will then they, we will then have much more control over kind of where the food aid is going um, and then the second uh, initiative as well is Plymouth Food Collective where the main providers of surplus food so for example um, DCFA uh, Plymouth Argyle Community Trust, Food Plymouth, and other partners are working, and Four Greens, uh, for example, are working closely together to set up. We hope to set up a community interest company, which will be able to collect together and buy um, buy where we need to buy bulk 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 buy food, um, get get donations, uh, fundraise, and all kinds of other initiatives, so that we're actually working together as a team to to provide food to organisations where they need it. But clearly, we won't be able to provide lots of free food. We, uh, that that will then be we we expect that to to support the new model where people pay a small amount of money towards the food. That will make that food collective approach uh, much more sustainable. Um, so clearly, there's quite a lot of work going on, quite lots lots of initiatives going on. This year for the household support fund, um, we haven't given out. Uh, we've given out some money. Um, Citizens Advice and Plymouth Energy Community will, will be giving out funding as as before, um, and also some funding has gone to our homelessness service as well. We haven't given out funding to organisations yet for food because we're still in the planning stages, and we think that we, as I say, we will be working through the Food Alliance and the Food Collective. Um, and then we'll see um, where we get to towards the autumn in terms of whether or not we will have a grants programme for the Household Support Fund that hasn't been decided yet. But what we do want to do is support the emergence of the food clubs and food co-ops and social supermarket models that um, Kelly can talk to you about. Um, and so that will be the kind of really focus of the Household Support Fund. And we really hope that the churches and Transforming Plymouth Together will be part of that. And I know that actually I should have said that TPT is part of the Food Collective um, um, offer. So we, we really hope that um, the churches and TPT will will support the emergence of these new models, will become part of the Food Alliance, will become part of the Food Collective, and will, will help to move towards setting up food clubs, um, uh, you know, where, where, where currently maybe you have uh, food banks, but, you know, you may already have food clubs. I know there are already some existing so that's um that's really the aim and i hope that um that's been helpful and, and i you know if you have any questions please do do email and get in touch and i hope to see you all soon thank you thanks for, and i just all should should say thank you so much for all the hard work and effort that you put into supporting people in the city and it, it really is um very much appreciated thank you i can't really add too much to it and, and, and kelly and i have sat on some of the initial meetings um to set up the food collective 
I know we were bamboozled with a few titles. Um, that will take time, clearly, but it's ongoing. I'm glad to say that this is, again, you're not on your own. This is a very much a citywide initiative, and I'm delighted that TPT and I know Kelly's involvement, you know, we are delighted to be on that table to try and influence that. Um, the eventual plan is, at the moment, is that this community interest company, as it's been called, the reason we went for that is because it is the easiest to set up from a legislative regulatory standpoint. But eventually, the, the hope is that that will transition to a member benefit society. Again, very much around the cooperative mo model where the members themselves have a direct input into how that is run and how effective it, uh, how effective it is. So that's just really a little snapshot. But please do contact Rachel. You can do so directly. I know she'll be happy to take questions uh, or any queries uh, from you. And there will be some more information. Um, I'm, I think the CIC uh, setup is well on track because, as I said, that's the easiest thing to set up. But the other aspects to it will take a couple of months to bed in. Okay. I think we're doing all right. Yes. Uh, thank you for reminding me. So, I'm, um, Rachel mentioned it, and I think, you know, I, I'd like to also add that thanks about all the hard work and dedication that you put into these practical issues we have to deal with, um, and in effect, to love your neighbours. And while I think, you know, we all agree that there will sadly always be a need for emergency food, more worrying is the fact that the level of food aid needed, as Rachel referred to, is increasing, whereas the supply side Demand is, demand is going up, supply is going down, and that is worrying. So what I'd like to show you now um, is what I think we can do as individuals, as churches, as, ch uh, as Christian communities, to support um, Trussell Trust's aim, stated aim, to saying together we can end the need for food banks. Well, I think a good place to start that is to highlight Trussell Trust's Guarantee Our Essentials campaign which we flagged in a recent newsletter, I hope you saw it. But this is just a brief video that articulates this really well, I think. I lost my job, I was in a really bad way. I was struggling to meet the bills, I was feeding the children, I was going without food just so that they ate. And the first time I used it, um, I was really anxious, really scared didn't know what to expect, thought that I'd let people down because I was having to ask for help. I'm quite a proud person and I don't like people to think that I'm struggling. But yeah, it was, it was hard to do. Over the recent years, we've seen more and more people come into food banks for emergency food because they can't even afford the basics. And the pandemic has pushed even more people into extreme poverty. Churches are vital to the work of food banks. They open up their buildings, donate food, provide volunteers and leaders, and show amazing care and compassion to people who need emergency food and support. And we'll continue to work together to provide this support for as long as it's needed. Food banks are doing an incredible job, but no one wants to have to use a food bank to be able to feed their family. And it isn't right that so many people are needing to. It's so important that food banks don't become the new normal. All of us depend on other people for our well-being, whether that's our families, friends, employers, businesses, or public services. And what we see at the food bank is that often it is people who have the least in our communities who are most affected by the decisions we make as a society about things like benefits, housing and employment. Unless these decisions come to better reflect the principles of dignity and compassion, justice and community, we will continue to see people be trapped in poverty and unable to enjoy a fuller life that Jesus intends for us all. As Christians, we need to be seeking justice and advocating for change, as well as showing compassion to people facing crisis. So at the Trussell Trust, we want to work together with food banks, with churches, with communities, businesses, local and national governments for a more compassionate and just society. 
where no one needs emergency food because we all have enough money for the essentials. That's why we're inviting you to join us in building a hunger-free future, a future without the need for food banks. That's an amazing aspiration. And what are they specifically talking about going to meet that essentially? That's just a, a snapshot of what she's referred to now. There's the worrying about money leaflet, which does focus on the cash first approach. There's a copy here, you're welcome to take some back with you. They're co uh, sponsoring this with the Roundtree Foundation to, f to try and challenge some of the issues around the social security system and that the fact that it's just not doing enough to protect an awful lot of the most vulnerable people in our society today. What this does is illustrate what they've calculated is the gap between a single person, a couple here, the gap between what is costing and what is universal credit providing for them to pay for the basic essentials. That's bread, milk, that sort of thing. And you can see there's quite a gap. And the background to this is that, that apparently the universal credit system has not geared itself, has not been designed to keep in touch with inflation when it comes to essential basic food items. So that is falling behind. So what they've said is we want to close this gap. And they reckon that that would take 1.8 million people out of poverty. That's quite a staggering figure. Basically, what you need to do, and I would encourage you as individuals and you as churches to encourage your communities to go on their website, you sign up, it's an online petition, and it will direct it to your local MP. Wherever you live, it will direct it to that local MP to say, this needs to be fixed. And it's doable. When you consider, dare I say it, the wastage of money within the government at the moment, this is not that big a deal, but the impact would take 1.8 million people out of poverty. And would also, the knock-on effect would be, those same people would then be able to come to the co-ops, or whatever you think is right for your community, and be able to afford to purchase food. Far better from a dignity point of view, from a respect point of view, that they don't have to queue outside a door. Uh, just quite briefly, I was at a, a particular project and talking to the leaders of that project. And um, she said to me, we open once a week, and I guarantee you, we open at uh, half past nine, but I guarantee you it'll be the same person waiting at that door quarter to eight every Wednesday. And the reason for that is, is because of the queue. And that's the only way they can guarantee to be at the front of the queue and get the best choice of whatever's available. I, you know, I... One of my seeds was campaign for change. And I think you couldn't choose a more positive model, and you may already be doing this in your churches, so apologies if, if you are, but I think it's worth reminding us all that this is a model for churches as well, from Micah 6a, to love kindness, do justice, and walk on the with God. And what I want to particularly focus on is the do justice bit. Is inequality ever mentioned in your church? communities. Good if it is, that's great. Does your church equip your, your fellow members to campaign or lobby decision makers? Sitting back is not an option really, not for Christians. Christians have been at the forefront of major positive social change. This is one of them. And what could you do to mobilize your church and your uh, fellow members to positively make a difference. Somebody said to me uh, yesterday, but it's only a petition. Yeah. But it could make such a positive change. There's no harm in trying, is there? I mean, I'm not advocating going out on the street with placards. You might want to do that. We're nearly done. Sorry, it's overrun a bit. Um, but I would like to highlight Feast of Fun. Um, I think it was Lynn who mentioned it to me earlier on. We've still got this pro project ongoing. 
There are funds available, and basically, if you've got any activity, if you've got anything planned, especially up to the summer holidays, we can help support you to feed children from the age of 0 to 18. Okay? We don't need an awful lot of details, just some ideas of the numbers you're going to uh, cater for, and we can give you £2.50 per child per meal. At the moment, that is up to the end of the summer, um, we've got two funders for this. Uh, one is uh, Meals and More, and the other one is, is POP, which I forget what POP is. Yes, yes, it, under the, yeah. But, uh, so there's two funders, but that will drop after the summer from £2.50 to £1.50. Unless we're successful, we might be able to get some other co-funders, but at the moment that is the picture. So please do get in touch with me. I'd love you to take up that, some of that funding to help tackle particularly holiday hunger, which is a huge problem in the city. I mean, some... If you think about it, there are some schools in this city where the um, free school meals level is around 50 to 55%. So those children rely on those free school meals. What do they do come school holidays? I saw something recently which you might have seen, and admittedly it wasn't about the city, but it really got to me, which is where uh, a family were being interviewed on TV, a mother and, and two t um, teenage children. Um, and the teenage daughter said on camera, my brother goes to school not to be educated, but to be fed. That's heartbreaking. And I think I'm nearly done. Mr. Sonia, that's my last slide. Thank you. Is there anything anybody wants to ask me before we sort of formally close the meeting? Yes, Tim. That's an interesting question. It's a lot easier to ask them. Yeah. Ask uh, it, it comes back to something I, I, um, that you reminded me about when um, the Afghan crisis hit. If you remember a couple of years ago when um, people were being evacuated and, and, and brought to the UK and there was a call made um, for support. Generally speaking, they were asking for clothing. Now, I was manager of the ARC at the time and if I remember rightly, we took in something like 30 tons of clothes. It was a phenomenal amount. And that was overnight. And we were inundated with it. And then the city said, stop, because we can't deal with this. The logistical problem of dealing with this huge mountain of clothes was astronomical. And they shifted their stance towards better that you give money and this is where you need to do it. And then we can channel that money more focused and more locally to the need on the doorstep. So I would say, personally, yes, I think strategically money could be a lot more useful. the thing is, I haven't got the figures off the top of my head, but there's a statistic, I think Trust the Trust have done, where they look back at something like the mid-90s, when there were a couple of hundred food banks nationally operated under the Trust the Trust banner, that has rocketed to over 3,000. Now, 
I don't think they're saying they'll disappear altogether. In fact, the presenter in the video said that there will be still some need for it. But we need to get away from there, back to where it was before, and where managing the whole issue around food uh, provision was pretty effective, to be honest. And this is why I think the shift needs to happen. And, and I know historically for churches it's, it's a difficult thing because as Christians we feel we're there to just, you know, do. But maybe we need to do it in a different way. Not just to help ourselves, but to help the communities that we serve. Thank you guys, that's been really great. I'm conscious we've gone over time, I'm sorry about that. Please do stay around. I will speaking to you today so we funded that post to help us set up set up that new model